trying to stage a recovery here, just about flat on the NASDAQ. What a turnaround from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The countdown to the Open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, the sound of the bond bubble bursting. We've got a new world now. Yields are attractive. You can actually get something of a, of a return uh, on bonds. There's a lot more value in this market than there was a, a year ago. You're probably closer to buying bonds than stocks. There is an alternative right now. Kia, there is an alternative, uh, and that's the front end in yields. One good reason to be bullish. Baskets of bonds yielding three and a half to four and a half percent. The bond market should 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 play a good role in a portfolio. The Federal Reserve can and will speak uh, very hawkishly going forward. There is no Fed put with an inflation rate with a, with an aid handle. Rates seem to be driving the bus. Policymakers wish they can use a scalpula. Instead, they're using a sledgehammer. This is a global game. Let's talk about that global game. Joining us now is TD's Priya Misra, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Priya, the carnage in the bond market. How much worse can this get? So I think we're in the midst of a repricing, I think a pretty big VAR shock in an environment where liquidity is not great. So trying to call the top in yields is, 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 is tough. Inflation's high. I think the Fed is telling us they're on a mission here. So, you know, the front end, I would say I'm staying away from that very front, the zero to five year part of the curve. I do think if, if inflation, which is sticky, the Fed here is not letting the lags or is not willing to tolerate high inflation to let the lags play out. I think the, you know, could the terminal rate be higher? We're at, we actually revised up our terminal rate to 5%. So that front end can certainly move higher. I do think the long end has value. I mean, given the volatility, UK rates move 50 basis points overnight, it's going to have a spillover in, in the US. But I think if you look at real rates, our view is that those real rates now are going to start to constrain growth. So, you know, I think three and a half to 4% on tens is uh, it's, it's going to be unsustainable for the US economy to handle that high long end rates. So that's where I see value right now. But, you know, trying to call how high it can get with the, with the market moving this much is, is, is tough right uh, now. Priya, you've broken it up quite nicely, the front end and the long end. So let's do that with Jim. Jim, the front end, we're repricing terminal rates everywhere. The Bank of England, we're looking for something north of 100 basis points. Through November, potentially, the ECB, we're now pricing another 75 basis point hike in October. Jim, do you assume that's still the direction of travel, that we're going to keep on repricing terminal rates higher into year end? Yeah, I do. And as a matter of fact, the uh, UK market might be looking as high as 200 basis points of yields on the front end by November. It has been stunning, the move that we've seen. The problem is nothing is broken. Now, financial markets are cracking left and right, but economies don't seem to be cracking, at least yet. Look at the United States. We've got a trend down in unemployment claims. We're still print we've printed 300,000 jobs every single month this year. We have very few signs that the economy is cracked. So without that, there's nothing to constrain the rise in yields. They'll just keep going up. The Fed will keep talking hawkish. They'll keep worrying about inflation until we see the economy crack. And I'm trying to differentiate that from the financial markets, which are cracking. You're going to continue to see that terminal rate creep higher. You're going to continue to see interest rates move up, and you're going to see financial markets stay under stress. So, Jim, you're on the same page as Priya on the front end. What about the long end tens? Priya's point here generally is that it's difficult to live with 4 to 5 percent interest rates over an extended period of time. Jim, do you agree or disagree with that? I completely agree with that, but I would um, put a fine point on it that an extended period of time would be years, that if you were to get to 4 percent or something above that, for a period of months, I think the economy can handle that. But if that is going to be the new equilibrium rate where we kind of settle out and then we see rates vacillate around that, that will be a big problem for the economy with the amount of debt that we have in the coming repricing of debt service higher to those type of levels. Equity futures right now down about four tenths of one percent on the S&P. We're about 26 minutes away from the opening bell. Can you just spare a thought for anyone who's got a trade cable sterling against the US dollar? Basically unchanged, unchanged on the day now. Can I just give you the range? The high was 109.31 in the last hour. The low 
was 10350 overnight. That's just the intraday trading range, and it's only 9 a.m. Eastern time. As for the global bond market, Treasury yields right now, they're higher. They were much higher this morning. They're up by two basis points at the front end, 422 on a 10 year, 373, up around about five basis points. Bank of America put out a note on Friday global bonds on track for the worst year since 1949. It has been that bad, that vicious, and we still have three months and change still to go. Katie Lines has more. Hey, Kaylee. Yeah, John, it's continuing even this morning, and that is not just a U.S. story. A lot of it in the last two days originating in the U.K. as fiscal policy, the idea of tax cuts and more borrowing in order to fund all the spending has driven gilt yields absolutely bananas. On the two-year gilt yield, we're up more than 50 basis points on the day after a move of a similar size just on Friday. So we've already moved about 131 basis points over just the last week. And of course, at the longer end of the 10-year gilt yield, up about 92 basis points. And that is fed through the rest of the world with treasuries uh, up about 24 basis points over the last five days. This is actually the first time in eight years that the 10 year gilt yield is above that of the U.S. Treasury yield. And on the subject of treasuries, I would note that with the moves we have been seeing, we have meaningfully broke out of a long term trend. The 35 year downtrend in 10 year rates has turned around and now it is back an uptrend skyrocketing on the 10 year up 200 something basis points so far this year and with it the bond bull market has come to an end global bonds are actually now down 23 percent from their peak last January and while that make it may, may make it seem like bonds are a bad place to be it still might be a better place to be than stocks maybe Tina is now actually dead because if you look at the S&P 500 dividend yield versus the 10 year Treasury yield back before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic it was 2.9 percent on that dividend yield relative to just 70 basis points on the 10-year Treasury. Today, we're talking 3.8 on the 10-year Treasury, 1.9% on that 10-year dividend yield. That is a gap of about 200 basis points and the widest gap since 2011, John. What a change in the last 12 months. What a change in the last couple of months. Katie, thank you. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research still with us. Jim, we've just blown up a decade of zero interest rate policy, a decade of it, of QE, trillions of dollars of negative interest rates. And Jim, you and I, Priya as well, we're all trying to work out whether we ever revisit that, whether any of that actually sticks. Do you think it does? Yeah, uh, if you're talking about going back to zero rates, I don't think at least in this cycle, we're going to have to run through an entire cycle, probably one or two recessions, and then maybe the economy reorients itself and we could visit the idea of going to zero rates. But for right now, I think it's pretty obvious that the 35, 40 year bull market in bonds is over. We're in a period of higher rates now. How much higher and how long it's going to take would be the debate. And that really depends on where in inflation peaks, how low inflation goes. Does it settle out at 2% or does it settle out at 4%? But I do think if anybody's hoping for those period of the pre COVID period where the market goes to zero, the Fed prints money, and everything rallies, because we've got liquidity slushing around in the system. I think that is a bygone era right now. So, Jim, what do you think will break the positive correlation between bonds and stocks? Because surely this doesn't hold indefinitely. Well, it already is breaking to some degree. If you look at the shorter term correlations, we're at a 15 year high. We've seen the price of bonds and the price of stocks move together to the most that we've seen basically since 2007. And any wealth manager that's managing a 60-40 portfolio knows this painfully well because sure. both their stock and their bond portfolios are falling at the same time. Typically, when that happens, you get that positive correlation. It's in a period that people are worried about inflation. And we're in a period where people are worried about inflation. So what ends that if we end the period of worrying about inflation? Well, that we might peak inflation soon, but that doesn't end the worry. The worry might come years later. So it's going to be a while, I think, before we see stocks and bonds revert back to what we saw between, say, 2000 and 2020. Brett, can I get your thoughts on that? Because I think that's absolutely critical for a lot of people in this market at the moment. When do the risk mitigation characteristics return to bonds in a way that equities are lower and bonds actually appreciate and yields drop? Because at the moment, the epicenter for the pain, the poison, is the bond market, leading to lower equities. When do we break that correlation? So I would say it's it's uh, inflation to uh, to Jim's point, but also growth. You know, at some point it takes a while. Uh, the you know monetary policy works with a lag. But are we talking six months from now? The unemployment rate starts to rise. That's when I think you have to revisit correlations because the Fed may not be able to respond. So the front end can will not provide you any hedge. 
But what about the long end? Because at some point, inflation comes down. It just it just takes a while. Growth slows down, starts to put downward pressure on wages. That then starts to impact CPI. Maybe it's a year out, and the Fed starts to cut rates. In our view, they're going to be cutting rates pretty aggressively in 2024. But how do you set up for it now? The market's forward looking. So I would say the long end starts to provide that hedge the moment you start to see the economy slow down. So it's not just inflation. I think inflation is more about the front. End. You have to pick your points on in the bond market. You know, is it credit? I'm a little nervous about credit risk premiums here because the debt servicing cost starts to go up. I would say it's government bonds in the long end that start to offer value against risk assets because we know growth is still going to respond to that move higher in real rates. And I don't think the bond bubble in real rates is over because that's a function of demographics, of productivity. We haven't seen any of that change, even if your inflation expectation and risk premium is higher. The real rate bond bubble is, I think, very much still here because these are very structural forces at play. Apriya, that is so, so important. Jim, can I get a final word from you on that, that real rates could remain suppressed? Yeah, I mean, they, they could remain suppressed. And keep in mind that if you go back to 1954, every cycle where the Fed was hiking ended with positive real rates across the entire yield curve. Chairman Powell mentioned that last week in his press conference. Now, he's using core PCE, so he's using a 4.8 percent inflation rate. And we're nowhere near that across the entire yield curve. So if the idea is where do real rates peak, it isn't here. It's probably going to have to be much higher before we finally see that, that end, at least of this cycle. Jim Bianco, Priya Misra, sticking with us. Shout out to Chris Harvey today as well. Chris published earlier this morning over at Wells Fargo. I've said this a million times. Nothing wrong with being wrong. Chris is coming out and saying it. We've been wrong. He said the following. Our belief that we wouldn't retest the 22 low until the first half of 23 was wrong. Despite retesting the lows, we feel the market bottom has not been established and stocks will make lower lows in 23 as EPS estimates come down and the Fed tightens into recession. It's that next shoe to drop that Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley has been talking about for a while that we'll focus on with Tony Despirito of BlackRock a little bit later. Coming up on this programme, UK assets selling off in the wake of new fiscal plans. Now we have that reaction in global financial markets to the irresponsible and reckless uh, statement that we had from the Chancellor on Friday. Sterling has had an absolutely wild ride today alone. That conversation up next. What I'm determined to do as Prime Minister and what the Chancellor is determined to do is make sure we are incentivising businesses to invest and we're also helping ordinary people with their taxes. And that's why I don't feel it's right uh, to have higher national insurance and higher corporation tax because that will make it harder for us to attract the investment we need in the UK. It will be harder uh, to generate those new jobs. The UK's latest fiscal measures fueling volatility in risk assets. Gilt plunging the pound take in a wild ride after touching fresh record lows early this morning. The shadow chancellor, Wayne Ginn. That's not what financial markets want to hear. They want to hear that the Chancellor has got a serious plan for getting a grip of the public finances. We didn't hear that on Friday. We didn't hear it over the weekend. And now we have that reaction in global financial markets to the irresponsible and reckless uh, statement that we had from the Chancellor. My good friend Guy Johnson joins us right now from London. Guy, the range on cable, the high today, 109.31, yep. the low, 103.50. What on earth? Um, I think the range is explained by the Bank of England, John. Um, you can almost hear, feel the energy emanating from the building over my left shoulder. They have a challenge now. What are they going to do in response to what we're seeing from the market? The market, John, is pushing. So you get the thin liquidity in the Asian session overnight. The pound plunges. Continues basically the move that we had out of Friday uh, into the weekend. So we reopen in, Asia, in the Asian session. Low liquidity goes down sharply. Then markets start pricing and pushing the Bank of England. And that is what you're seeing in, in, in cable right now. You are basically seeing the market beginning to price what we're seeing in the gilt market, which is the Bank of England responding. And we've seen throughout the morning, headline after headline after headline, the market is now pricing uh, the Bank of England to do X. 
now it's X plus one, now it's X plus two. The market is pushing the Bank of England. How does the Bank of England respond to this calmly? How does the Bank of England respond to this without looking like it's panicking? That, I suspect, is the question that is being asked and hopefully answered over my left shoulder at the Bank of England. Guys, the domino after that that interests me a whole lot more, and I know this is tremendously difficult to game out. What we've got here is the spiral that follows. You've got looser fiscal, which means tighter monetary. I'm trying to work out whether that means looser fiscal after that and what the response yep. of the government would be if the Bank of England validated what is currently priced. So that, that I think, is, is what changed over the weekend as well. You heard from the Chancellor, and the Chancellor seemed to imply that further tax cutting could happen. Now, would that further tax cutting happen in response to the Bank of England stabilising in the kind of spiral that you're talking about. But he certainly threw a little bit of extra gasoline on this fire over the weekend by suggesting that he is not done and that spiral uh, could continue. The other challenge the Bank of England has as well is that if it were to curtail its QE, would it look like it is helping the government out and therefore effectively financing indirectly what the government is proposing? Huge questions for the Bank of England. Massive debate right now, Guy, that we're all having with our guests on whether what we're seeing at the moment is just the required adjustment through higher yields and a weaker currency to attract capital to finance a big deficit or something disorderly, the beginning of a self-fulfilling downward spiral as such. From the people you speak to, Guy, is it the former or the latter? Uh, I don't think we know yet, but the, the, the balance is beginning to shift, isn't it? Um, this doesn't feel orderly at this point. You haven't seen these kinds of moves for a very long time. As, with, as ever, John, it, it, the, the adjustment is one thing, A to B. It's how fast you get there, I think, is, is the real critical question. Uh, th there is an argument to be said that this is a country that needs maybe a lower tax burden to, to encourage a more vibrant economy. Now, that's just the starting, that's just the first step on a journey, but maybe that, that is required. But you are trying to introduce that into a fairly febrile market right now. We know that, which is why this, this becomes more challenging. So it's the scale and the speed of response, and I think it's the latter that I think is really interesting. This country clearly does need to make some changes. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree with that. How you do that and how quickly you do that is the question here. Uh, and I think that is what the Bank of England is going to be looking at very carefully. It's not necessarily the ultimate journey. It's how fast it takes uh, the, the country to get there. Hey, Guy. Always great to catch up, buddy. Looking forward to the coverage in about 41 minutes' time. Guy Johnson and Alex Steele are going to guide you through the close, the European close, and pick up on this story as well. Priya Misra, can I throw that question at you? It's kind of the important one right now. Are we seeing just the required adjustment through higher yields and a weaker currency to attract capital and finance this deficit? Or are we seeing something disorderly, some kind of self-fulfilling downward spiral? I would say right now it seems very disorderly. Depending on how the Bank of England responds, they will determine which way it goes. You know, if, if there's a sign that they're not independent, they're actually facilitating this move. I think it becomes disorderly much faster. And, you know, at that point, you have to sort of question the independence of the central bank. Are they committed to the inflation target? I mean, this is a giant experiment that the UK is undertaking. Um, and is the Bank of England going to be an enabler or, um, you know, are they going to fight it? I think the guilt sales that are supposed to start next week, I would argue it's very hard for them to say that, that they can sell in a market. It's going to get much more disorderly. So I think, you know, maybe postponing it by a month, that is something we do expect that they do. Some sort of verbal intervention, that they are there to support the market for liquidity. Um, you know, uh, I, I think all that we get. Anything larger um, or and no, you know, or, or rather a, a pushback on intermeeting hikes, or even if they don't do an intermeeting hike, pushing back on that terminal rate, I think will make the, you know, I think that's when that down, uh, downward spiral accelerates. Right now, we're still waiting to see. I mean, they just had a meeting last week. I have to think that the Bank of England had an idea of what the fiscal side was doing. They still went with, uh, you know, 50, not 75 basis points. So I think they might be trying to just gradually raise policy as opposed to, um, you know, act like they're facilitating. But any sign of facilitation or that they are working together, I think, does take this to another level. Priya, how well understood do you think the gilt market actually is, given the average maturity is 15 years, the debt pile is dominated in sterling? How well understood do you think that is? 
Right. I, you know, I think which is why the guilt sales were necessary because just passive runoff, what the Fed is doing was not possible. Uh, but the UK market's also very much a domestic market. The uh, the pension funds are very large holders of long end paper. Um, I th I'm sure they're now questioning, you know, where do guilts end up? I mean, if you have high inflation, high fiscal, I mean, the government's talking about tax, uh, about spending cuts. But in an economy that's in recession, I think you have to question whether they'll be able to get these, um, you know, spending cuts done next year. They didn't align the tax cuts and the spending cuts. And I think that is going to make people question long term, where should these guilt yields be? And I think that then has ripple effects across asset allocation within the UK. So it's a and it's a less liquid market, I have to say. We're, we're yeah. getting used to seeing very large moves in guilds. So it is a different market than bonds. But there are big spillovers between what happens in guilds and bonds and treasuries. So I think we should all be paying attention, even if you are not involved in the guilt market. Jim Bianca, I wanted to give you the final word. We've heard repeatedly over the last week, this is a big risk. It's an experiment. Why is it the wrong one? Well, <clears throat> because the UK has an inflation problem and the Bank of England came out in August and said that in Q4 they would be in recession. Now, Q4 is Saturday, so I guess we're in the final week of not recession in the UK. And now that they're going to cut taxes, cut regulation, you're going to inject massive stimulus into the UK economy. Let's assume that works. Let's assume they get what they want. That pretends much higher inflation. That pretends more volatile markets as they try to adjust to the idea that the inflation rate is going to ratchet even higher. And so we're in for a thrill ride. You know, you asked if the markets were disorderly, and I agree with Priza that last week, no, this week, maybe that they are, you know, on the way towards becoming a lot more disorderly. I say things have settled down. Intraday, the two-year in the UK is still up about 50 basis points. So still seeing some major moves. Priya Misra, Jim Bianco, to the two of you, thank you. Sterling, just about unchanged. Up next, the morning calls and later, Tony Dispirito of BlackRock. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bow. Futures just about recovering, down a third of 1% on the S&P. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. First up, Raymond James upgrading Planet Fitness to a strong buy, signing its defensive business model and attractive valuation. UBS downgrading Lyft to neutral, $16 price targets, seeing better opportunities and greater upside in shares of Uber. And finally, Wedbush cutting its Micron price target down to 65 a share, expecting softer global demand to weigh on its upcoming results. That stock is up by 6.8% in early trading. Coming up, the VIX hitting a three-month high. BlackRock's Tony Dispirito recommending investors own selective growth and value stocks to overcome the volatility. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bell. Good morning to you. Four straight days of losses on the S&P 500. Will it become five? Futures down about four tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a quarter of one percent. On the Russell, the small caps, negative six tenths of one percent. The opening bell in New York rings. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yields higher on a two-year for 13 straight sessions. On a 10-year by six basis points on the session. On the day to 374.27. 12 months ago, the two-year about 20 basis points. This morning. 4.23 and had a little look at 4.30 earlier in the session. Massive change. Euro dollar negative a third of 1%, 96.54. Dollar strength still present through much of G10. Sterling was down and down hard to about 103.50. It's bounced back to 109. Just short of that at the moment, 108.20 on cable. So big turnaround there. About 30 seconds into this one, let's get you some movers. At the opening bell, here's Abby. Well, yields up, stocks down. That is a story once again. A little bit more of a muted version of that than what we were seeing earlier in the pre-market when the S&P 500 E-mini futures were down 1%. That two-year yield was up 14 bips, now up three bips, but still super high, 424, as you were just mentioning, John. That, of course, means that Apple, it's off of its 1% lows. Right now, perhaps about to flip even. It's down just fractionally. Wells Fargo, interestingly, the bank's not getting a bid from yields being higher. That probably has something to do with some of the yield curves uh, coming in, just a little bit more mixed action. Chevron down six-tenths of 1% off of its lows as well. This, as oil has inexplicably turned around, it's now up a little bit after having been down more than 1%. 
The big movers, though, might be some of the casino operators. Las Vegas Sands soaring up 10.3 percent, a bit of a bright spot. This, of course, as uh, Macau, uh, they're uh, said to be allowing group tours back in Macau as early as November. And they, of course, uh, some of these casino operators can receive as much as 70 percent of their revenue from that Macau region. So again, a bright spot there for some of the casino operators, John. Abby, thank you. Thank you very much. And I misspoke a little bit earlier. I misspoke. It was win that is up and up big. It's up by a little more than 8 percent off the back of the story that Abby's discussing. About a minute and 50 seconds into this, stocks are down just a little bit on the S&P, down a quarter of 1 percent on the Nasdaq. We're negative just 0.03 percent. Ed Ludlow, we're trying to avoid a fifth yeah. day of losses. Yeah, we're flat on the Nasdaq 100. That fifth day of losses would be the worst run since February. Some pain in the mega caps, particularly in Tesla. You're looking at the likes of Alphabet and Apple also being a drag on the index. This is a global story, right? And the story, not just the angst coming out of the United Kingdom, but also what we're seeing in terms of rate expectations in Europe. This is the Bloomberg World Tech Index on track for its biggest annual decline since 2008. We do focus on the Nasdaq 100, though, because we bring up the next board and look at how the Nasdaq 100 has traded relative to Asia, relative to Europe. The pace of declines has just been greater. That was the focus of our NLive Pulse survey. 914 respondents Two-thirds of them basically say profits in the tech sector are going to disappoint in the quarter ending September through to the end of the year in the final quarter of the year. But this is what's so fascinating. Where does the Nasdaq 100 go? The majority of respondents, both pros and retail investors, see us hitting a 10K handle, John, not a 14 thousand mark on the Nasdaq 100. I keep talking to you about the direction of travel. Really hard to justify calling a bottom in tech stocks when you see that real yield continue to push higher. Setting just above the June lows on the S&P at the moment. Good to catch up, Ed, as always. The Nasdaq, the S&P, has been a tough, tough time. The transports heading towards their biggest monthly decline since March of 2020. Taylor has more. Hey, Taylor. Hey, John. So let me talk about some of the individual stocks as well, and then we're going to end on sort of the big transport look and the Dow transport theory. Let's talk about the airlines for one, right? In the midst of sort of the macro headwinds of all of the uh, maybe recessionary talk, there's that hanging in the backdrop. And then there's also some actual real risk when you think about some of the airlines. American, for example, heading into court today with JetBlue to defend a partnership that they have. DOJ and some other states had filed suit against them. So that's sort of that idiosyncratic story. And then there's FedEx. And if you change up the board, we can talk a look about how the transport index have done since that FedEx announcement. Remember, they came out early with the pre-announcement, said that they weren't going to be meeting some of their targets. Then they came out with a real release. And FedEx really on the macro headwind citing huge weakness, but also some of that execution risk that you and I have talked a lot about with some of these individual companies, given the weighting in the Dow transports, that has also dragged that index lower. I don't want to say I'm a Dow theory expert. Maybe Abigail Doolittle here to my left can weigh in. But John, when you think about where we are, socks relative to the S&P 500, We've talked about that maybe being the quote new Dow theory. Old, as you know, transports relative to the Dow Jones index. Regardless of how we're categorizing it, it has been lower and lower. Really, again, some of the macro headwinds here on the horizon. It's the only time we talk about the Dow, for good reason. I know, Taylor, I know. Thank you. And I'm never like invited back on this show. Of course, now. you're welcome anytime <laughs> in the next segment, too. Taylor Riggs is going to count you down to the close a little bit later on. I wanted to talk about foreign exchange as well. Year to date on foreign exchange, the moves have been absolutely phenomenal. And I can tell you where we are currently because of the bounce back in sterling in the last couple of hours. Sterling's no longer the biggest loser in G10 against the US dollar. That's still the Japanese yen down by about 20 percent. Sterling's down by 19.8 percent. The Swedish currency down by 19.5. Norwegian currency down by 17 and a half. The euro's down by about 15 percent. The relative outperformer in G10 against the US dollar, the loony Canadian currency, still negative 7.3 percent year to date crazy stuff. The S&P 500 very, very close to the year's lows. And the strong, strong dollar this year, Candy Lyons, has not helped. Strong and continually getting stronger. I mean, all hail King Dollar, John. It seems to be the only thing anyone wants to buy right now up against everything in G10. As you said, as there is a narrative that hawkish central banks, specifically the Federal Reserve, particularly the Federal Reserve, are going to keep supporting this dollar, while other central banks hiking cannot do enough to support their currencies. Just look at the euro or the pound for an example of that. And this seems to be the narrative that this isn't going to change anytime soon, that there isn't much standing in the way right now of dollar strength. Obviously, that has big ripple effects, including for stocks, especially those big multinationals that have significant exposure overseas because the value of the sales made elsewhere is worth a lot less when it has to be 
converted back into dollars. So those FX headwinds are quite large, and that is something that Mike, Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley pointed out in research this morning, saying that by his calculations, every 1% change in the dollar index has a negative half a percent impact on profit. So he said fourth quarter S&P earnings will face an approximate 10% headwind from the stronger currency. That may help explain why S&P companies with low international sales are outperforming those with high international sales, which is that blue line we're looking at here on this chart. Of course, the currency impact is felt in other classes, asset classes as well, including commodities, because those priced in dollars are more expensive for overseas buyers. So that coupled with demand concerns around a deteriorating growth outlook has dragged hard on the likes of the metals, with copper down about 30 percent over the last six months gold down about 16 percent and of course crude sub 80 dollars on wti we are at the lowest levels since january john kaylee awesome work this morning as always kelly lines there I want to pick up on that quote that kelly just used from mike wilson and morgan stanley if you want the numbers again i'm happy to share them with you on a year-over-year -year basis the dollar index is now up 21 percent and still rising based on our analysis that every 1% change in the DXY has around a negative 0.5% impact on S&P 500 earnings. As Kelly said, fourth quarter S&P 500 earnings will face an approximate 10% headwind to growth, all else being equal. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson. Tony Despirito, BlackRock, joins us right now. Tony, I'd love to get your thoughts on that dollar call from Mike Wilson and the team and what it means for this equity market. Just how much damage can we expect from this FX market to this equity market stateside. So, thank you. Uh, good morning, John. So I think the, the earnings outlook really faces two headwinds. Uh, one is what Mike Wilson is citing, which is the strong dollar. And I think that is, is easily quantifiable, which he has done. The other, quite honestly, is the slowing economy. You know, the Fed started hiking in March of this year with a 25 basis point hike. Um, you know, if you talk to any economist, and any economist will tell you those rate hikes impact the real economy with a lag, at least six months, but many would say a year to two years. And so we haven't even begun to feel the effects of that on, on the real economy and hence on earnings. So I do think the earnings outlook is, you know, is cloudy. Um, now, the good news is valuations have come down a lot, right? The market started the year uh, with the S&P trading at over 20 times earnings. That's now down to a much more normal 16 times earnings. Tony, just in terms of how far you would push this out, to your point, the dollar story, easily understood, easily quantifiable. The story you're talking about, the rate hikes, a lot of that means it's already baked in and the slowdown in our future is already guaranteed. Tony, how far would you push that slowdown out through next year? Yes, yeah, so I think it's really through the first half of next year. Now, the market can react much more, uh, much more quickly than the real economy. So I do think that once the Fed pauses or even pivots, right, that'll be a positive signal for the market. So we as investors have to stay forward-looking, realizing that the earnings outlook is, is, is for weaker earnings. But on the flip side, at some point, we're going to get a Fed that has to reverse itself. Until then, Tony, what on earth do you do? Yeah, so my recommendation has really been to stay balanced, right? Um, and in terms of that balance, you know, I've been leaning the portfolio I run, the, the BlackRock Equity Dividend Fund, uh, more towards stability sectors, right, to help ride through uh, whatever earnings hip cup we're going through. Now, there's a challenge there because many of the stable sectors that you go to, utility staples, are very overvalued trading at 20% premiums to the market. And history tells you, you know, that might, buying at that level might feel good in the short run, but in the long run, over the next 12 plus months, doesn't pay off. That said, I'm seeing a lot of, I, I see a lot of possibility in the healthcare sector. That sector's trading at a roughly 10% discount to the S&P 500, despite having good long-term growth characteristics, as well as good stability in a recession. And so I'm seeing a lot of opportunity there. Tony, how much has your world changed in the last 12 months with a two-year that's gone from 20 basis points to something close to 4.3? Yeah, look, I, I think that's, that's what's caused the dramatic change in valuations in the market. The market's gone from, like I said, over 20 times earnings to a much more normal 16 times. So that's really the good news is that valuations have corrected. But like I said, I think we've yet to see the fundamental impact of those rate increases, and that's what keeps me tilted towards stability. And Tony, do you need that rate increase to stop going up or come back down to get that kind of enthusiasm back into this equity market? 
Yeah, I think the market would be really excited by a pause. Um, and so I think that's really uh, what the market needs. Let's see if we get a pause, Tony, because listening to Chairman Powell last week, it was anything but one. Tony Despirito there. Ms. Lamp Mateka over at JP Morgan. And Tony, thank you for being with us, as always. Ms. Lamp Mateka of JP Morgan writing the following on some of this. It should be increasingly probable that the next months could see some dovish tilt by the Fed. This could act to limit further moves up in long yields. There could be a good entry point for another bouncing growth at present. Tech stocks in particular could do better. Be interested to see if Marco Kalanovic and the team here stateside for JP Morgan echo some of that a little bit later because this market has gone against their calls in a major, major way. The equity market about 11 or 12 minutes into the session shaping up as follows. We are just about unchanged on the S&P, just about positive on the Nasdaq by six tenths of one percent. Coming up, the Fed facing criticism from Washington once again as it hurries to tame inflation. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. Uh, there will likely be some job losses. We're going to do all that we can at the Federal Reserve uh, to avoid deep, deep pain. Senator Warren has things to say. That conversation, I'm next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Terry Spath, Zuma Wealth Founder and CIO. That conversation at 3.30 p.m. in New York, 8.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. Uh, there will likely be some job losses. There's a really good chance that if we have job losses, it's going to be smaller than what we've seen in other situations. We're going to do all that we can at the Federal Reserve uh, to avoid deep, deep pain. And, and I think there are some scenarios where that's likely to happen. Senator Elizabeth Warren taking game at the Fed once again as the central bank moves to tackle inflation, writing in a tweet over the weekend the following. Fed Chair Powell seems determined to push the economy over a cliff, even after he admitted rate hikes won't lower key prices. Destroying jobs and crushing wages of millions of workers is reckless and dangerous. Recession is not the solution to inflation. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government joins us now from D.C. Emily, how alone is Senator Warren? How much company does she have? John, really, that, that is the sort of question to ask here. Certainly, Senator Warren has been a critic of the Fed, of Jay Powell. This is not the first time that she's come out and really questioned the strategy that they are doing in rate hikes. She says that, obviously, some of the reasons that we're seeing inflation have to do with things like COVID, things that the Fed doesn't necessarily have control over. But it's important to note here that we're really seeing kind of her as, as a bit of a loner in this field, as far as really calling out the Fed. Remember, Jay Powell, he got re nominated with the support a strong bipartisan number of senators really backing him here. And so it's clear that he does have the confidence of a lot of Washington, even though he is going to have a couple critics like Senator Elizabeth Warren. But at the same point, it seems like most of D.C. is confident and willing to trust him with these rate hikes that they will eventually lead America's economy to being a little less high on inflation. Emily, do you sense that that changes if unemployment goes from a three handle to four to maybe even a five? The difficult thing about rising unemployment, particularly for the White House, is that it has been their statistic that they've really clung to, trying to show that Biden has done a good job with the economy. They tend to ignore the inflation number and stick with unemployment. That narrative is going to have to change if you see unemployment rising. Even if that is something where the Fed is trying to prepare people already, going out, saying, hey, there's going to be some pain, but it's going to be worth it in the end, the White House is going to have to figure out a way to ride that wave. And if it starts coming in the next month or so right near the election, that could actually have impacts as far as voters going to the ballot box and voting against the party in power, Democrats. We couldn't agree more. Emily, it's a complex, complex moment. Emily Wilkins there down in D.C. We've asked this question a million times. How do you convince people that higher unemployment, the loss of your job, is a price worth paying to get inflation lower? That's a very, very difficult job to do, and that may well be this Fed's job to do that job before year end. Complex stuff. Equities right now on the S&P unchanged on the Nasdaq. We're positive six tenths of one percent. Big week ahead. Ton of Fed speak. Sprinkle of data. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor, look, you're back just like that. See, I told I'm you you could come back, back any time. This is amazing. I, told you. I knew banned. that deep Give down you were so generous, John. Fan. 
Let's take a look at the generosity of this Federal Reserve. As you said, a lot of Fed speak up here, so really going to be hearing from them. We did, of course, you just played a great sound clip, of course, from Raphael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed. He'll be back up on deck around noon. And, of course, in our hours in the closing bell, really focused on Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed as well. And that is just today, because if you take a look at the calendar for the rest of the week, yes, it gets busier and busier. Talking again about some of the job losses that we heard from Raphael Bostic, but it is a necessary, if you believe this Federal Reserve, to bring down inflation. I think, John, for me, what really stood out were the big comments from Jay Powell last week talking about our message has not changed from Jackson Hole. That is going to be the key here if they can reiterate that tone as well as we push forward to the rest of the week. Finally, I'll wrap up some of the data for you. Last week, and that's a lie. It wasn't even last week. It was like within the same 24, 48 hour period, G10 central banks had hiked 300 basis points. So this is a U.S. hawkish Fed, but this is a global central bank hawkish narrative underway. Taylor, for a long, long time, it was our currency, your problem. When do you think this starts to become mm. their problem? These moves are big, big, big moves in foreign exchange. And take a look at the Mike Wilson uh, note out this morning, talking a lot about the big dollar pressure that is putting on not only the world of equities, but every central banker to the rest of the world. And this is where Jay Powell comes in, as you know, the central banker to the rest of the world when they really start to think about dollar strength. And is it dollar strength or is it pound weakness? As you know, with currency pairs, it's a little bit of both. Today, it might be more about that pound weakness relative to some of that big dollar strength we've seen. What a trading range it's been on sterling. And the day still has some hours to go. Taylor, welcome back anytime. You know that. Taylor Riggs will catch up with her later on today and, of course, tomorrow on this program. The Fed speak. It's ridiculous. At the end of the Fed news conference with Chairman Powell last week, I turned to the former vice chair, Richard Clarida. If you didn't see it, I turned to him and said, the bad news, the bad news is that the quiet period for this Fed is over. And he couldn't stop laughing. And I imagine you're finding it quite painful because you're going to get a ton of Fed speak today. To Taylor's point, you'll hear from the Boston Feds, Susan Collins, you'll hear from Bostick, Logan, Mester. That's just today. And then you'll hear from Evans and Bullard and a whole lot more tomorrow as well. So tons to keep up with. About 21 minutes into the session, talked a little bit about the equity market and where we are at the index level. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. It's pretty interesting here at this point, John, because we're up slightly on the S&P 500, reversing a greater than 1% loss in the pre-market. That appears to have to do with that two-year yield coming off of its high, still higher, but not as high as it had been. Now, yields up, that should mean, and it does mean, utilities and real estate, those high dividend yielding sectors, are down. But it should also, in this current environment, mean that the mega cap sectors are down because valuation becomes a concern. That's not the case. We have consumer discretionary tech and communication services on top. The financials, which you would think would get a bid on yields up, this is the conundrum of the year. It is down. Now, over the last five days, it's been brutal, as you know, John. If we take a look at the sectors over the last five days, big, big declines. Interestingly, the worst sector, though, is energy, down 10 percent. So this year's up sector, the big up sector, it's down over the last five days as oil has tumbled back below $80 per barrel. Today, a little bit higher at this point. But you have also real estate down, discretionary down, materials down, really nowhere to hide. Today's a small gain for the S&P 500 right now, up about one-tenth of one percent, John, right above that June low, as you were talking about. It's on light volume. It's going to be interesting to see, of course, how the day plays out. Abby, thank you. Thank you very much. Talked a lot about the Fed speak. Do you want the ECB speak from Christine Lagarde? Monetary policy has to deliver on its mandate. Fiscal measures, these headlines are fascinating. Fiscal measures can help in tackling inflation. The aid must be targeted, temporary, tailored. Wide fiscal measures are not helping monetary policy. After a decade of asking for it, they're getting it, they're complaining about it. Seeing more wide than tailored fiscal aid right now. The length of volume of any TPI, you know, all that stuff, any buys there will consider inflation. Some assumptions in the ECB forecasts have been overtaken by events, you think? That's ECB President Christine Lagarde on the tape in the last 10 minutes or so. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching. I'll bring you the trading diary in just a moment. In the equity market, about 23 minutes into this session, equities on the S&P up by a little more than a tenth of 1%. And how about that for a bounce back on the NASDAQ? Up by eight tenths of 1% on the NASDAQ, even with yields pushing just a little bit higher. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
little more than 25 minutes into this session this Monday morning. Good morning. Just about positive on the S&P, nicely positive on the Nasdaq, up eight tenths of one percent. Unexpected early this morning, given what was happening with the bond market, that fades a little bit as well. Two tens and thirties. Your two-year, 12 months ago, something like 27 basis points. Right now, 421. It was pushing through 430 a little bit earlier this morning. We fade that story too. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. What you need to be watching this week begins with the president speaking at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Then a busy slate of Fed speak with Collins, Bostic, Logan, Mester, all on the agenda later today. Chairman Powell speaking tomorrow morning. ECB President Christine Lagarde speaking again on Wednesday. We get US GDP and initial jobless claims on Thursday. And we round out the week with personal income and spending numbers and the UMich sentiment survey on Friday. From New York, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.